and welcome uh, to today's UKIS Lunch Hour. I am Joelle and I'm delighted to be joined by a fabulous uh, panel to talk about divergent paths. Europe, uh, the UK and Ireland and the very changed and changing relationship between all of them. Within this context, I think uh, we can all focus on the very significant anniversary that is upon us. It is 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement. This is uh, obviously a critical moment in history to reflect back on and the very challenging context uh, of Northern Ireland, especially in the context of where it sits and what it represents between Ireland and the UK. One thing that we don't talk about in the context of Northern Ireland is the critical relationship going on in the background, and that was EU membership. So 25 years before that uh, Good Friday Agreement, uh, the Ireland and the UK acceded together to the European Union. And in the 50 years since, we've seen a radical transformation in both countries, socially, legally, politically, and in terms of uh, the demographics of both states. And it is for us today to reflect back on that change. So as we sit marking seven years since the referendum, three years since Brexit, 50 years since Ireland and UK accession, and now 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement, a lot of anniversaries, you can tell that I've done my maths on this. What we want to do today is to bring together um, academics and journalists to really reflect on those changes. Uh, joining me today is uh, Professor Imelda Maurer of the Sutherland School of Law at University College Dublin. Uh, we have Luke McGee uh, at CNN. We have Professor Colin Murray at Newcastle University and Professor Damien Chalmers of the National University of uh, Singapore. What we also have joining me is a very loud drill in the background and I hope that drill will not interrupt us too much. But let's start off and let's set the scene. First, uh, let's turn to you, Amelda, representing in this context Ireland. So quite a few people thought that once the, the UK withdrew from the European Union, that Ireland would very quickly join, well, quickly follow them in leaving. If they acceded together, surely they're going to leave together. But what we actually see is uh, some of the highest percentage of public support for EU membership in Ireland. I think it was 88% uh, in 2022. I wonder if you could reflect on that and give us some thoughts on, on how that relationship is and why it's so different from the UK in the same context. Thanks, Joel. I think there's a, a kind of a short time frame in which to answer that question, which the 88% reflects the huge support Ireland felt it had received post uh, the Brexit referendum and in, and in the negotiations, particularly around the tangled issue of Northern Ireland, but also more generally around the trade dynamic and how that was going to play out for Ireland, because we still a lot of the cheddar consumed in the UK comes from Ireland, for example. You know, there's a very strong trade links, but those trade links have diminished 50 years ago when Ireland joined. So this is the more long term view. 50 years when Ireland joined, we simply could not have existed outside um, the European communities that then was uh, if if the UK was inside it, because I think something like 80% of our trade was with the UK at that time. But the irony is we joined one union in order to lessen our dependence on another union. So by being within the European Union, this allowed us to develop new trade links and um, new political links, new cultural ties, so that our, our dependence on the UK um, wouldn't be quite so strong. Now, that said, you know, we're inextricably linked with the UK, culturally, linguistically, we have two common law systems. Um, I think British people constitute the second largest minority group in Ireland, for example. Um, so there's very strong cultural ties and that very messy shared history as well. Um, so it wasn't about trying to cut off the UK. Um, I think it was about re-establishing or rebalancing the relationship. And I think that's where that 88% figure comes from at the moment, is that Ireland has sought to rebalance that relationship in the last 50 years. And Brexit has shown that it has managed to achieve that. Um, I, and I mean, this is, is the kind of critical point that shared, if not very, very complex history, 
that again is also in, inextricably linked to the, the wider questions of trade, of economics and of well shared people between the two countries. Luke, I wonder if you could now talk a little bit again scene setting for the discussion that we have ahead about the UK and EU relationship. Where have we got to in it? Where are we sitting? So things at the moment certainly are a lot better than they were, but um, I still, whenever I'm asked this question, make the joke, the quickest way to wind up an EU diplomat is to ask them about Brexit. Um, I think the um, I think the current relationship is kind of broad picture is defined by two simultaneous truths. The first is that both sides want to stop talking about it. They're absolutely exhausted from the negotiations, you know, from the withdrawal agreement to the backstop, to the protocol now to the winter framework. So there's that dimension that runs into direct conflict with both sides need to be able to present wins to their own side you know sort of for want of a better word winning the UK needs to be able to look as though it can present these benefits the famous one being um the claim for the vaccine rollout I mean I, I always point out that um the UK was in the uh, EMA when uh, Pfizer was approved so make about what you will but the EU also um needs to not make it look like it's you know if you leave it's going to be this sort of land of milk and honey so there's this there's this um there's this underlying tension between those two factors. Um, I'd say though things are a lot better, there is still an inherent um, sort of underlying mistrust as well. I mean, one of the things that you hear so often from EU officials and diplomats is, you know, sure things are stable at the moment, but we've seen three prime ministers ousted in quite a, a short period of time. So, you know, the, the 2019 mandate doesn't necessarily apply to the current prime minister is something that they often, you know, they're not sure that this position is going to last. So there is an inherent sort of, is mistrust the right word, but uh, inherent sort of apprehension. In terms of current sort of conflicts, there, there aren't really any immediate ones. There's certain concerns that come up around what's going to happen with financial services. They point to the fact the memorandum of understanding still not been signed, but there's only actually been, I think, two rulings from the Commission on on um, financial services, and um, the second it isn't really a conflict, but you know, uh, relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, the the largest area of concern, I would say, is that Stormont isn't sitting and the impact that has on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And this really does bring us to the, the critical anniversary that we've been talking about so much over the last few days. And Colin, the Good Friday Agreement at 25, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, one of the unsung background uh, actors in all of this was EU membership. I wonder if you could reflect on the significance of the anniversary and almost the state of the Good Friday Agreement now, three years post-Brexit. Yes, thanks very much, Joel. I suppose um, when you think about the 1998 agreement, you can think about the EU as providing the context to that agreement. Um, how much more difficult might it have been to reach that agreement if Ireland and the UK as the two state actors involved, let alone the parties on the ground in Northern Ireland, had to think about the trade border on top of everything else that was going on into April 1998. So, when the two were already sharing and pooling um, their legal orders and to a certain extent even their sovereignty in the context of the European Union, it made bits of the 1998 agreement sing when we had um, the idea of North-South cooperation. An awful lot of that was grounded on shared issues from agriculture um, through that were based on a grounding of EU law. And that agriculture and fisheries um, cooperation, say, that could exist, and then into tourism and transport, all of that was found to well, heavily rely on overlaps in EU law between Northern Ireland's jurisdiction and Ireland's jurisdiction. That facilitated strand two of the 1998 agreement and all of that cooperative element that was going on within it. So if you like, a pooling of sovereignty at a European level fitted with a complex interaction between two states to reach a peace agreement in the context of Northern Ireland. That peace agreement in 1998 basically said these two states don't sit just as neighbours. They don't sit alongside each other. In the context of Northern Ireland, they are in an intense cooperative arrangement. And the EU facilitated that. The problem is, once the UK was torn out of that EU framework, how do you make 
North-South cooperation? How do you make the 1998 agreements equality arrangements work? Would so much of that uh, arrangement um, and those provisions relied upon fundamentals of EU law? And so the Brexit process and the broad idea of Northern Ireland's place in the Brexit process became how do we substitute something in for the arrangement that previously existed to protect what Theresa May repeatedly called the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts, the letter and spirit of this agreement. So how do you create something to protect it? For May, that was a backstop that effectively kept the entire of the UK in close alignment with the EU. So Northern Ireland would retain all of its elements of linkage into the EU as part of an arrangement for the entire of the UK. For Johnson, Sunak and Truss, that was much more we will separate out Northern Ireland. We will give special status to Northern Ireland in a, in a very distinct way from the remainder of the United Kingdom, and it will exist in a special relationship with the EU. If you like, if you go through the Johnson Protocol into the Sunak framework, you get different iterations of trying to make those special arrangements for Northern Ireland work, and some of the tensions that brings out of, well, changing Northern Ireland's relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom. I think, again, in so much of the reflection that we now have on the Belfast Good Friday agreements, it comes back to exactly as Colin has been saying, these same questions of, of control, of governance, of sovereignty, which, as we all remember from uh, the debates and discussions leading up to the referendum and very much in the seven years since, has been a core issue or a core point of debate in that relationship between Ireland and the EU, between the EU and the UK, and the UK and Northern Ireland. Damien, as our resident expert on the concept of sovereignty, I wonder if you might, and this would be better if the drill was still going and I could pun on it, but I wonder if you could drill down on the uh, idea of sovereignty and how it plays into all of these different relationships. Right, well, I think one of the the interesting things about sovereignty, and I don't want to overplay its significance, and certainly the UK, and I'd say particularly in this, in this context, maybe uh, uh, um, mainland Britain, it's a very different vision of sovereignty from that you find actually in many e other EU states. And to, to, make this, to make this point, I'd say that sovereignty is one of those things everyone thinks they know it when they see it, but they're not, like the dark, but they're not sure, and then when an academic talks about it, it gets a bit obscure. But there are basically two ways of seeing sovereignty, two dimensions, a big boss dimension and a political community dimension. The big boss dimension is I can have sovereignty over you. I can tell you what to do. The sovereign is the one who can boss everyone else around. The political community dimension goes more to us being able to recognize certain political communities, notably as states, as communities of free and equals, because we see an in international society, they're sovereign. And when one looks at the debates in most EU states, a lot of it has focused on that second dimension, to what extent EU extends or constricts that, those particular states as communities of free and equals. Now, what happened in the UK prior to Brexit, and this, this did come up in the context also of the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol, was that it almost focused exclusively on this big boss dimension. Who was the big boss? Parliament or EU law? And this had three effects, which still persist um, uh, even post-Brexit. The first was a huge gap between legal authority and political authority. Legal authority, the UK, in practice, had to say the EU was the big boss in a way that almost no state did. But the EU clearly didn't have that political authority within the UK, UK more broadly. Secondly, the UK was very bad unlike Ireland, at negotiating issues of political community and tensions between EU law, the EU, and issues of political community as they may come up in the domestic settlement. We saw these approached very squarely, for example, in Irish referenda. They were clearly at the heart of Brexit, that all the debates about uh, the left behinds, different types of elites, um, et cetera, et cetera, self-government. These went very much to that, but they were, uh, approached at least by the, the Remain side in, in highly 
uh, technocratic ways. And thirdly, poss possibly because of this, and you've certainly seen this post Brexit, the UK in particular has missed out a little bit on thinking a little bit more broadly about what questions of political community might mean. So if you look at what has happened since Brexit, things continue to be put out in a very technocratic way. Sovereignty is associated often with government rule. But the fact is the UK has become quite a, I mean, if you look at things like uh, immigra immigration, in many respects, it's become quite an open society since Brexit. This was not what people expected. Uh, and one still, one still has a situation where sovereignty is seen and this, this led to increased tensions surrounding the negotiations uh, around the Windsor framework, around simply about control rather than about political community. This, this has softened with the, uh, with the framework. Um, it's associated with notionally parliamentary sovereignty, but because the executive controls the parliament, it gives, and this has always been a little bit of the bane of the UK, the executive, something of a three pass in a way that other states with constitutional guarantees and checks and, checks and balances don't have. I am delighted to say that the Slido is lighting up and I can barely keep uh, abreast of all of the questions that are now appearing in front of me. So I uh, would also like to remind everyone out there listening that you can ask questions to our fantastic panel on Slido and I'm going to do my very best to have them answered for you. But um, just picking up again on the themes that we've heard about in like the meaning of sovereignty, especially within the UK context where it has been such a divisive issue, I wonder if we could actually contrast it with the meaning of sovereignty in the Irish context. How has Ireland seen and understood sovereignty in its relationship with the EU? How is it so different? Imelda. Thanks, Joelle. I think the key issue here is that Ireland embraces this notion of kind of shared sovereignty, that it is possible. It's not a zero sum game, um, it, that it is possible for us to be independent polity, um, but one that chooses. Um, and the critical link here is between politics and law that Damien referred to, um, that chooses to share that sovereignty with the Ent supranational entity that is the EU and how does that convergence of politics and law happen in the Irish context it happens through the con written constitution uh, power is given from the people to the um, the levers of government and governance um, and in relation to the EU following a, a an important judgment called Crotty way back in the day at the time of the single European act um, there have been referendums or nearly always around uh, major Europe, well, always around major European treaty reform. Um, now, I think that's as you and famously on two occasions, the people were asked twice as to what their views were. Um, that sits a bit uncomfortably with me, um, but I'm not sure what the alternative would have been in the context. And yet, um, in both instances, what is telling and which shows, I think, the strength of the relationship between the political and legal context is that the people it wasn't it didn't linger that when we had second referendums that the matter is deemed closed after that event and life moves on and the law moves on and the politics moves on so even where there has been a contestation between law and politics and um, it once there is a mechanism of resolution and once that happens the world moves on and you don't there isn't this sense of well should we be in the eu at all or should the eu be the way it is those debates settle down, if you like. Um, so the moment of contestation passes and the EU remains um, an inherent part of the Irish political and legal orders as a result. So this is uh, one of the, the key points too that we're going to keep coming back to. And I know that so many of the questions are now turning on uh, that relationship and, and the consequences of referenda. And I'm so sorely tempted to divert us off to talk about the importance and meaning of referenda in the context of Ireland, Northern Ireland and the UK. But I actually want to ask a final question from my own perspective before we really focus in on the Slido questions, which is, uh, what do you think has been the biggest, most significant change on the ground for people in the context of Brexit and for continuing EU membership. We're going to start with Luke and uh, then just ask the rest of the panel. 
I think um, I just want to start with actually tying in um, to the previous point. I think um, in terms of for those still in the EU, the sovereignty question um, was really kind of became interesting during the pandemic, where you saw so many member states um, going their own ways on on, on you know lockdowns and um, uh, and just various pieces of government policy. Um, so I think that that put the sovereignty question in a slightly different light for a lot of um, EU member states and uh, sort of Brussels level two. Um, here in the UK, I mean, the biggest change since Brexit on the ground, um, I mean, it's it's got to be the queues, um, you know, um, whether that pertains to, uh, you know, people going on holiday or um, the ability to get goods in and out of the country. It's, you know, the, people always say, you know, the, the effects of Brexit are largely intangible um, if, if um, they may still be, you know, large, but they're, they're often intangible, whereas that's one you can see. Um, and it, it really is quite stark in comparison, and it, it's very, very hard not to try, to tie the queues at Dover to um, to Brexit. I think we're all very aware of the queues over the Easter weekends. I think we're also going to be commemorating that for a few years. But Colin, to you, what are the the standout impacts for people on the ground? Well, if we take the ground as being Northern Ireland. There is essentially an ongoing governance order collapse in the context of Northern Ireland that has not been fixed and that directly relates into Brexit. If you think back to the summer of 2016, there was still a position where Sinn Féin and the Democratic Unionist Party were in government together in Stormont and cooperating. But quite quickly, it became impossible to see where their shared experience of being in governance together would be. If you set aside the sudden shock of the RHI scandal, which precipitated um, the Assembly and the Executive's collapse in early 2017, what was going on in the background at that point was that the DUP and Sinn Féin found it very difficult to perceive what their future was going to be in government together at that point. Um, they had just secured things like the devolution of corporation tax to Northern Ireland. And that was supposed to mean that Northern Ireland would bring its ta uh, corporation tax rate more into line with the tax rate in Ireland, and it would use that as a way to, to attract inward investment. But as soon as Northern Ireland's place in the European Union went up in the air with the Brexit referendum, that ability to create a positive environment for business in Northern Ireland disappeared with it. And we've been scrabbling around in the time since to put together anything that might look like a working programme for government, but not even that, a working platform that the parties could agree to disagree on. Outside the small window that Luke has talked about of COVID and the executive functioning briefly, basically in the teeth of the COVID crisis, the parties have not been able to put together a, a shared or even common vision of what Northern Ireland after Brexit is going to look like. And if you can't have that, well, then you're going to have this, well, unsettled polity that frankly, looks like a bit of a basket case for any idea of internal investment into it. And until things settle down into a post-Brexit environment, we're probably going to see a continued collapse of those arrangements and something like direct rule from Westminster continuing to exist. And the drill is back on this end, so I can talk a little bit more about the machinery. But focusing uh, or reflecting just on the party positions, I wonder if I might just uh, push you a bit further to say, well, why did we see such uh, support from the DUP on Brexit if there wasn't this very, very clear vision of what that would mean? Um, I suppose it comes back to a lot of what Damien talked about on sovereignty and big bosses. And if you like, what we saw nearly half a century of shared EU membership was an ability of law in Northern Ireland on lots of different areas to track closely to law on the other side of the border. Belfast and Dublin were held in a level of alignment with each other because of that shared underpinning of EU membership. And the big picture of the DUP has always been to try to thwart any idea of um, unification of Ireland. 
And the promise that Brexit held out was to move Northern Ireland, to move it out of the orbit of the rest of the island and more into a close legislative orbit with London to make it, if you like, more difficult for anyone ever to foresee a unification because it would become more difficult legally to achieve it if those common underpinnings were stripped away. Those common underpinnings were always a threat in the DUP's mind to Northern Ireland's place within the Union, the Union being the United Kingdom. So for them, this was, a, if you like, a really quick line towards um, thwarting or certainly making much more difficult in the foreseeable future any debates towards unification on the island. And I think that was going on in the background of an awful lot of DUP thinking on this issue. We're going to circle to the, the question of reunification, the question of a potential referendum on unification and the very challenging political and legal complexities around that. But first, uh, Damien, I wonder if you might respond to that or even, well, what has, uh, what has changed on the ground in the context of EU membership and Brexit? Um, I think I'm not well placed, uh, I mean, other panel is best place, better, better place to talk about Northern Ireland. In some way, almost all of you are better placed than I land up in Singapore to, to set out their experience of the UK. But as someone that passes through, I'd follow up with what on the point Luke made. When I come to the UK, it's greater bureaucracy. And that was almost an inevitable consequence of Brexit, paradoxically, that if you set up a market with smaller economies of scale, which has to duplicate a lot, you will have more bureaucracy. And the idea that there are big deregulatory gains to be had is somewhat illusory because of the Brussels effect, that even if you deregulate, industry still has to operate on world markets, which have a certain regulatory level. And they're going to lobby, lobby against that deregulation because it strips their competitive advantage and, and, and ignore it uh, if it takes place. And so one, one sees that everywhere. I and mean, we will just have to wait and see uh, how this is addressed over time. Uh, the paradox is that it probably means a greater rapprochement and something closer to what Theresa May wanted with the EU, if you want some of the deregulatory de de nirvana that some in the Conservative Party talk about for Brexit. There we go. As, uh... Another one of the regulatory divergence issues is the very different and divergent Wi-Fi availability in where I'm now sitting. But um, just to complete the circle and to complete this this reflection on impact and change, uh, Imelda, I wonder if you might speak uh, on Ireland. Um, in, I think thinking about what the biggest impact would be, Joel, it, I wouldn't put it so much in the legal domain, but in, in relation to uh, the economy more generally, and it's FDI, the foreign direct investment, you know, Ireland, pharmaceutical sector, and of course, tech, you know, we are the home of many of the major European uh, multinational, we are the European home of many of the major multinationals um, who have come to locate in an English language country that is in the EU. And that position seems um, stronger now after the UK have gone because we're the only English language country, even though our, our, by the by, our official language in the EU under Regulation 1 is actually in Irish. Um, so, um, but I don't see that um, English being abandoned, as it were, at the EU level anytime soon. Um, so I think FDI, the other, and how did that happen? I think the story around it is interesting. Ireland was a huge beneficiary in the, for um, structural funds and inward investment from the EU. And it's a, it's a case almost of, you know, if we build the roads, they will come. You know, so many of the roads in Ireland were built. Our agricultural sector was built up as well. It had been primitive, I think it's fair to say. And we were able to leverage that ultimately in order to entice um, FDI into the state and um, predicated very strongly on a highly educated workforce, many of whom had emigrated, but who were willing to return to the opportunities arise. And that, that was the narrative that led to the Celtic Tiger. And then, of course, we know how that went here shaped ultimately. And um, the other big winners, of course, are women. Um, Ireland, women had very low status in Ireland. Um, there was an unofficial well, 
unofficial because it wasn't written into law, but it was in every public sector contract and followed by the private sector, that once a woman got married, she had to leave the workforce. Um, and this was only changed just before we became members in the early 70s. And so I think that is one example, but a key example that's indicative of the changing dynamic in, in terms of relations um, between, uh, between women and the um, politics and law in the state. And when I was a student of law, which was so much later than that, the domicile of a woman was still with her husband, a married woman was still with her husband. She had no real legal identity outside that of her marriage um, until I think the early 90s. So women's position has certainly benefited from EU membership. I think my favourite uh, fact that is no longer true about Irish law, and if there are any constitutional Irish lawyers listening, please do correct me, but I do remember hearing this at Trinity, is if a woman committed a crime in the presence of her husband, it was assumed that her husband made her do it. Um, but that is no longer law, please don't cite me, and certainly don't commit any crimes, uh, especially not in Ireland or any other country. But rights are a key issue. And I think one of the unsung uh, anniversaries this year beyond the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is that it's been 25 years since the Human Rights Act was enacted, and 20 years since uh, an equivalence uh, law in Ireland. One of the questions that we have here on Slido is, uh, what do you think will happen to the UK's membership of the Council of Europe, or the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights, and what are going to be the implications for Northern Ireland? Luke, can you give us the political context first before we drill down, it's not funny anymore, uh, and talk about Northern Ireland and the UK? So Luke, um, over to you. Yeah, asking anyone to predict what's going to happen with the UK's membership of the ECHR, I mean, the, the question is really God knows. Um, I think I think it's, um, you know, it actually it comes back to the initial point about um, the distrust between um, the EU and the UK and some, for, uh, coming from Brussels towards the UK in some senses in that it's, um, you know, as we as we approach the end of this, uh, this, this, election cycle I suppose it's become one of the few sort of wedge issues that the conservatives are able to have a traditional um, sort of red meat and, and while everyone sort of wants to move on from Brexit arguments it's sometimes very helpful to frame policy through the lens of, um, of Brexit um, and, and of course while ECHR is um, is not an EU thing it's um, I, I'd, I'd be I'd be amazed if the UK actually um, came out of it. I, I just because I think the the implications and the process of doing it would be so complicated and so widely criticised. I just don't see that a government under um, Rishi Sunak or certainly not Keir Starmer would um, would be willing to do that. But I suspect that it's going to be a wedge issue for a very long time because it's um, you know by by in, in, I remember a, a sort of Tory Brexiteer saying to me a few years ago that um, one of their great regrets about um, Brexit was that they no longer could blame the EU for everything. Um, so I think it's um, I think it's. Uh, it's going to be around for a while because, you know, and this isn't a specific thing to the UK. Every every politician, every leading politician needs a bogeyman. You know, it's one of the it's one of the great political tactics is if you can point over there and say that's the problem. So I think the debate will continue, and it's probably the debate is <laughs> the debate's probably um, a more live question than the reality of it would ever be. But um, but that, that that's a sort of interesting question though because. Your rights can still be um, sort of, you know, suppressed, even if you're a signatory to a convention on rights, you know, so, uh, and uh, I think that's probably the larger impact of this question around the UK as a membership. So it's very long rambling and, um, and sort of slightly off topic answer in some ways, but um, I think that's sort of where the UK situation is at the moment. Well, Damien, uh, picking up on Luke's point that this is politically red meat, but it's it's too complex really to actually you know take place. Isn't it just a case of you know withdraw, so just get rid of it, just pass a law, it's fine. I, I, I don't for the re I don't think they will for the reasons Luke gave, and also it's just too complicated. Even if they withdraw, they'll find out the judges will find other ways of uh, applying these rights. I think. In reality, and without wanting to get too technical, there's a lot of way, things that could be done to, uh, to resolve the issue. 
well, not to resolve it, but to take the heat out, but no one really wants to do that. So just simply, uh, you know, getting rid of the Human Rights Act doesn't mean you have to leave the ECHR. The UK was in the ECHR for a long time without the, uh, without the Human Rights Act, uh, without applying the Human Rights Act, and it would just wait, and some of its worst abuses were prior to that. Uh, and it would wait for compensation, it all uh, dribble along. It could do that if it wanted to. The other uh, paradox about it is, it's only if we're talking in the context of Northern Ireland, the issues that really bother the UK government about the ECHR is really the interpretation of one provision, which is Article 8, the provision on right to respect for, for family life and private life. They, they don't like, and they haven't for a long time, and this is not just uh, conservative Labour governments, like the way that provision is done, in particular how it restricts immigration and asylum policy. That provision is rarely invoked in the context of Northern Ireland. So some of these things are reasonably separable. Um, the third thing that has to be said is, and I think they could have if they were smart, but I'm not sure they will be, have some common ground with almost all Council of Europe states. One of the big issues of the, both the ECHR and the ECJ is that there, there's a ratchet effect. No one goes to the ECHR to argue there should be less rights. They always go there to say, can we build on the existing rights? So even with a reasonable court that's saying no nine times out of 10, if that was reasonable, it's still, the, 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 the progression is always one way. And that is an unusual structural feature of these courts that they have this ratchet effect. And this is something that I think will have to be addressed in due course. I don't think it's central to having good quality of rights that one has ratchet effects for courts. And this has been, it was pointed out a little bit uh, by the Cameron government, but they once again try to make it too much about cultural politics. So I, I, my own view is there will be technical, fix, technical fixes. So we, we have the option of technical fixes. So no strong uh, sense so far that we're going to be seeing the end of the ECHR anytime soon. But again, reflecting on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there was a commitment within it to keep the ECHR in Northern Ireland. Colin, what is the relevance of the ECHR, or even rights in the context of Northern Ireland and governance? Well, I think building on what Luke and Damien have said, at the moment we're seeing um, a Sunak government that wants to get on with certain things, but has to preserve a sort of unstable majority, a majority that doesn't well, really adhere to the fact that he was the second choice candidate for Conservative Party leader. So he needs to throw red meat to sections of his support base to keep them on track, especially if he's making compromises around things like the Windsor Agreement, and especially if things like the retained EU law bill is moving very much into the background, as reports have recently suggested. If they aren't getting those things, they Sunak needs to have something to answer to those sections of, well, of his parliamentary party and to his wider support base. And that's where we see um, a lot of the legislation around um, the, uh, the illegal migration bill, around the legacy bill in the context of Northern Ireland. All of that is to protect veterans or to stop small boats. It, the wedge issues that are being talked about here are making targeted darts into the territory of rights non-compliance or certainly um, gray areas at the very least of rights compliance that will take a long time to resolve in the courts. So Sunak could think, well, I can happily throw that red meat, and by the time any of this is resolved in the judicial setting, I will likely long have left the prime minister's seat. There is an opportunity to pick up votes and to try to move the debate into ground that is more comfortable for the Conservatives in the run into a general election without ever going into the need to abandon the ECHR completely or even abandon the Human Rights Act. Instead, we're seeing, well, it be eaten away in particular contexts around things like the legacy of the conflict in Northern Ireland or immigration. And that relationship is backed up by a tabloid media that also really does not like Article 8, that sees Article 8 and the right to private and family life as 
restricting its ability to run the sort of stories that were prevalent in the U in the UK right through into the 1990s and the early noughties. And there's an idea of a shared interest between some of those newspapers and the Conservative government to try to restrict rights in this context. And that creates quite a powerful narrative block against rights. Now, the problem with that, and it gets to be a technical problem only because it's overlooked in the context of UK-wide political debates, is that the 1998 agreement embeds the ECHR much more deeply than it embedded European Union membership. European Union membership is the context to the 1998 agreement. ECHR, um, met not only membership, but incorporation, is the substance of large sections of the 1998 agreement. It relies on the European Convention rights being substantively incorporated into Northern Ireland law. So much easier to talk about or to make these darts into the territory of rights non-compliance and make them as high profile as possible than ever to try to unpick those arrangements. But at the same time, the agreement around the protocol builds in European Union level rights protections, rights and equality protections in Article 2 for Northern Ireland. So it's almost like Northern Ireland is getting a double lock around rights and equality protections that other bits of the UK don't have. And you get into that territory again that the more the Westminster government tries to restrict these rights, the more you're putting Northern Ireland out on a limb by comparison to the rest of the UK. And the more you're tearing at that fabric of, well, the union in the hands of a supposedly unionist government. If you think back to all of the loud statements from Theresa May through Johnson, through Truss and Sunak of the preciousness of the union in Conservative Party thinking. Imelza, I wonder if you could feed back, uh, feed in on this. Um, Joelle, I suppose my my concern is I'd be I'd be concerned that this rights debate will proceed in a similar way as the referendum debates, which simply ignores Northern Ireland and the price being paid is very high for Northern Ireland now. But I would suggest is high for all of the UK politically at least. And I'm worried what I hear at this distance around the rights debates is that once again, there's a, a tendency to marginalize the Northern Irish issue because it, you know, it, it's it's what two million people or close to two million people. It's not a big part of the United Kingdom, but the problem is politically, it is a very big part at, at moments of tension and that could flare up again. And from an Ireland perspective, I don't to be glib about it almost. Um, Ireland likes to see a happy United Kingdom. You know, politically, it's in our interests that our nearest neighbour with whom we share a contested or controversial border is perhaps more accurate. Um, that, you know, we want we want that to be a stable state. We want that to be a state that is at ease with itself, with its people, with its minorities and with its relations around the world. You know, so there's nothing but goodwill. And I think it's reciprocal. Well, I'd like to think it's reciprocal, at least. Um, so. What worries me is when you get this sort of identity politics bleeding in and uh, Colin's idea of the darts, you know, picking on particular interests or particular rights, um, which subvert, I think, some of that stability um, would, would cause worry over here. But our main, the main concern of the Irish government would be not to undermine the, Belf the Belfast Agreement and how to align that with these, these discussions and these rhetorical debates around rights in the UK. No, nobody talks about that and that concerns me. I think this is going to be the, the key echo throughout this whole discussion of uh, the voice and choice of Northern Ireland. So many of the questions that are on Slido here are talking about divergence and the very difficult position of Northern Ireland in that context, diverging both from the UK in terms of the rights rhetoric that we're just talking about and also in terms of regulatory divergence and what this means. But another uh, question that has come up a few times from Slido is, well, what about generational shifts in attitudes to the European Union and attitudes to the Union? So 
In this, uh, the, the question I have for the panel is, how would you reflect on any potential shifts in generational attitudes to the European Union and what this could mean for Northern Ireland? I would need to emphasize again that in the context of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, its, it's core idea was the idea of self-determination. No one and nobody, not the Union, uh, not the European Union, I should say, not the UK and not the Republic of Ireland, is going to tell Northern Ireland where it should be and what it should do. So what does this mean for the future? Uh, one of the questions also turns to um, what happens in the next general election if we have similar uh, numbers in any kind of assembly election or what if even we have a Sinn Féin win uh, in the Republic of Ireland. So uh, Colin, can I turn to you first before we go to Luke? Goodness, there's a lot going on within that from divergence through to um, the position of Sinn Féin. Um, I suppose the position of Sinn Féin actually in terms of generational shifts is a neat way into those bigger issues because Sinn Féin of course for most of the last half century has been a decidedly anti-EU party um, and uh, it has done so in the context of both Northern Ireland and Ireland as a way to attract votes to it. Um, so to hoover up people disaffected with certain aspects of the EU policy and to use that to try to grow its strength as a party. And what we've seen in the last decade is a dramatic shift in Sinn Féin's position. And that shift is in itself intrinsically interesting. This is a party that's um, trying to slough off, to abandon elements of that protest vote that was long associated with it and move it into a position where it's seen as being a party of government. And if you look throughout the debates around the protocol, throughout the debates around the Windsor framework, Sinn Féin has been, well, really quite emollient towards the UK government when it could have made itself decidedly uncomfortable. It didn't loudly shout about the hollowing out of the protocol or the terrible things that were being done under, well, either Johnson's protocol bill or the trust premiership under Sunak. It was profoundly uncomfortable with large parts of it, but it also was trying to not create an air of high tension. And it wasn't getting into that direct slanging match between it and its direct political rivals in the Northern Ireland context, because I think it wanted to almost try to put itself into this position as being seen as a party that's looking to govern in the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland. That was very much the pitch that it wanted to put out. And that's a pitch that it wants to extend in the context of elections in Ireland. If Sinn Féin is the leading party in government after the next Irish general election, EU issues are probably going to be quite low down on the list of priorities, but they would be entirely welcoming of closer UK relations with the EU. And I think they would be seeking to present themselves as, as statesperson-like as possible in that area. Because again, their concern was to protect some key overlaps between the legal order of Ireland and Northern Ireland that are going to matter if a referendum is coming down the line in the future, particularly around things like goods, rules and rights, so that they can say, look, this isn't a difficult shift, and they can have that as part of their pitch. And they're going to focus very heavily on things like housing and health care, because to try to address those is to change the pitch of what a reunification debate would be in the context of Ireland, the pitch to voters in Northern Ireland. It is not you are moving from a high welfare protection model to a low welfare protection model. You're, as one person has said it, giving up the Tories in London for the Tories in Dublin. They want to change the narrative around welfare provision in Ireland to make that the focus of their pitch to voters and to a generation who see themselves as being, well, marginalized and, and often left behind by a lot of the developments of welfare and well-being and difficult to get on the property ladder, um, social housing having so much more attraction, the 
idea of a, a deeper welfare state protection net running more holistically throughout society and not being um, concentrated on uh, old age pensions, say, all of that fits to both Sinn Féin's core vote and to trying to change the debate around what Ireland is as a polity and trying to shift almost that social element of the polity to align with well, the much greater alignment in rights terms that now exist in civil and political um, rights terms that now exist on both parts of the island. If you like, had you listened to a debate about the United uh, about a united Ireland 30 years ago and you divorced it from the conflict, you would have heard things like, well, in Ireland they don't have divorce. And there would be an emphasis on rights divisions uh, between the two, but between um, same-sex marriage, the divorce referendum, uh, reproductive rights, all of these things are looking much more aligned on a cross-border basis. So you can easily see where Sinn Féin's narrative is going to shift towards and has clearly shifted over the last 10 years into the areas of housing and healthcare. And to try to almost make it so that their pitch to both voters in Ireland is going to be, we are going to make these things better. And the vote, uh, to voters in Northern Ireland, you're not going to have to give things up if you go into United Ireland. That's an absolutely key part of where debate has gone. I would say yes for all the discussion of the hand and of history on uh, the shoulders of those original architects of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. A lot of the day-to-day -day realities are about that, health and housing. But Luke, how do you reflect on this, this idea of politics and generational shifts? Um, I, I don't have a huge amount to add to that. Very, very comprehensive and uh, an interesting answer. But um, I, I thought the, the point that you were just making now about reframing uh, the question around um, the United Ireland is interesting. I just happened to, the week before last, interview a uh, former uh, IRA volunteer turned Sinn Féin politician who was making the case for me actually to come back to the terms of rights. And they were saying, you know, being taken out of the EU, we had our, as Republicans, we had our rights taken away from us. And I thought that was an interesting way of framing the uh, United Ireland, um, you know, taking the sort of points here of rights, Sinn Féin, the EU and the United Ireland. It was an interesting... Uh, coming together all those things um I, i'm this is far from my area of expertise borrowing from your colleague um katie haywood uh and her work on this over the years um i think the kind of interesting question for the generation that's now sort of becoming of uh political age is um is is the sense of is um is is a united island inevitable and i always think the question of a sense of inevitability in politics is one of the most interesting because it you know that we we saw the impact it had on the scottish uh, electorate after that referendum although that question now is open again it certainly gave a huge amount of movement and um I, i've read lots of her research which talks about you know it isn't necessarily people having a, a, a strong political motivation for it <laughs> It's a sense that this will happen because of the situation Brexit has left Northern Ireland in. And I suspect, coming back to points many of you have made, actually, that Northern Ireland is so often the neglected um, part of the UK when it comes to media coverage. I, you know, um, if if that sense of it being, you know, made made to feel exceptional continues, then may, maybe maybe that that um, inevitability question will become more um, more pressing. Uh, the lights going off in this room is uh, telling me or heavily hinting that we are coming to the end of our hour and the end of our lunchtime. So the last question I want to ask the whole panel is to, well, look forward. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the last 25 and 50 years, but what next in the future development of those complex and complicated relationships of the UK, of Ireland, Northern Ireland and the EU? So, Amelda, what next for Ireland and Ireland's relationship with the European Union? Do you think it's still likely that um, it will represent um, the whole Ireland in, in many issues, or has it increased the role of Ireland in the European Union? Thanks, Joelle. I think um, Ireland has to 
assert itself more vigorously in the European context now, because in the past it often shared positions with the UK, but the UK is the larger state and with bigger resources would inevitably carry the arguments forward. Um, but that has now had to change. So new alliances are needed at the European level by the Irish. Um, and I think Brexit has shown that they've actually, they can do that to great effect. But like all of the smaller states in Europe, um, you have to be very selective about what you have an argument about because you just don't have the personnel on the ground or the expertise to constantly going in and, and argue about particular issues. Um, I think the, you and I have been talking in another context. Um, the two words that really sum up the relationships going forward are closure and continuity. The UK is looking for closure with Brexit. Um, but closure, because well, as a lawyer, I'd say there rarely is full closure. What you have is a continuity defined by the need to constantly rebalance these relationships. So an impatience looking for permanent closure undermines the trust that is needed for those relationships to rebalance the British, the British constitution, to rebalance relations with the EU for the UK, and also then for Ireland to rebalance its relationship with the UK in this context. And um, so I would say we need, it's a compromise answer perhaps, but we need both. The UK needs its closure because it needs the stability, but within that, to, or ironically, to achieve it, you actually need continuity. So for continuity or closure, Damien, what's the future of the UK-EU relationship? Oh, I think it'll become like Switzerland. Uh, that neither of the big political party, if the EU allows it, and neither of the big political parties want some meta relationship, there'll be a series of side deals because stuff just happens. And when you, when you have someone like Lord Frost saying, well, let's get rid of the 180 day limits on uh, EU and UK citizens traveling from one part to another, that's uh, just pretty much pretty close to me to a uh, right to reside subject to you uh, having sufficient resources in one or the other. So you'll have that, probably some informally, some autonomous adaptation, because Parliament will work out that industry will do it otherwise. And this will all be stunted quietly uh, under the, uh, the carpet. And I think the ERG had its last hurrah, uh, uh, which is a bit of a poodle over the Windsor framework. So that's where I see it going for the next five years. Luke, any last hurrah from you in terms of uh, the future? I'd never underestimate the um, Conservative Party's ability to uh, get to, to shoot itself in the foot where, when given the opportunity. Um, look, I think what's emerged over the course of the last uh, few years over here is, it is at times a grudging acceptance that there is a power imbalance. No matter, you know, nothing John Redwood tweets is going to change that. Um, and I think, you know, there's no great appetite for closer um hugely close alignment there's also no great appetite for huge deregulation so i would agree that i think we'll end up in if the eu allows it in a, in a sort of swiss style um side agreements and uh, endless arguments although we haven't had endless arguments on the panel we will end where we began uh, it's been 25 years since the belfast good friday agreement colin what's the next 25 years for northern ireland well, I suppose instability has come from dysfunction over recent years, and that instability is going right and deep into um, Northern Ireland society and business. There's been no settlement over what's going to be the trading rules affecting Northern Ireland at any point over the last seven years, but the Windsor framework actually gives something different. There is as Luke says, a space for endless arguments, but they're a sort of low level argument, not a meta argument as to what is going to be Northern Ireland's status. So this overarching, um, we'll throw the protocol out completely approach. There's going to be lots of arguments about how do we make this work in practice, but that sort of arrangement, even though the Windsor framework is in a lot of ways much more complex than the protocol, the protocol was quite clean in terms of what it did for goods arrangements for Northern Ireland. And the Windsor framework is much more messy and muddy, especially when things like the storm and break are taken into account. All of that gives a space where, well, what Amelda talked about earlier and foreign direct investment might now happen in a Northern Ireland context. And there could be that sort of stability of an economic climate, 
Now, even if governance continues to not really work in a Northern Ireland context for a while, maybe even for some years to come, because, well, this has all been imposed as a fait accompli and the DUP see a lot of votes in continuing to resist this for as long as possible. So we might not see a resumption of power sharing. We might nonetheless see a lot of the Windsor framework, the protocol elements actually bed in and become well, impossible to shift because they become the backdrop on which trading is actually working in the Northern Ireland context. And if that is the case, 25 years on down the line, and we're talking about referendums on Irish unification, maybe it gets us out of a zero sum territory. Because if the protocols arrangements is uh, are relied upon, for large sections of Northern Ireland's economy, it's going to be really difficult to suddenly rip that away. Any debate around what the six counties is going to look like in its place in a united Ireland might find that it involves particular trading connections to the UK, even if the UK is still not back to being an EU member state at that point. Because if that's what Northern Ireland's economy relies upon, if the Windsor framework is successful, well, then you're not going to be able to suddenly remove that. And again, we get back into that idea of the dilution of sovereignty that is involved in EU membership. The Windsor framework is emphatically a dilution of sovereignty, and it's maybe one that won't even go away in the context of change in statehood. If that becomes a reality for Northern Ireland, say, in a quarter of a century's time. And on that wonderful note, can we conclude by saying that in reflecting on 50 years or 25 years or seven years or three years, that nothing is inevitable. But it is wonderful to be joined by such great voices uh, to discuss about those possibilities. And uh, if nothing else, to echo this shared commitment to peace and to prosperity between both islands and also beyond that uh, throughout the world. Can I say as a final and concluding thoughts before I thank our wonderful panelists um, that this is uh, our latest UKIS lunch hour. Our next UKIS lunch hour uh, is on the 25th of April at the same time, that's one o'clock, in which we'll be talking about divergence and exactly the same questions and concerns that have been coming up uh, today in our discussion on Ireland, Northern Ireland and the UK. I'd also like to highlight that uh, our three wonderful academics on the panel have uh, been part of our ongoing symposium that is taking place in collaboration with the Sutherland School of Law at UCD. And you can read all of the fantastic blog posts, again, reflecting on that 50 year mark and the impact of EU membership on constitutionalism, the impact of Brexit on law over on the Verfassungs blog. Uh, I'm going to say that again slowly because it is a wonderful German term, but it is the Verfassungs blog. We're going to tweet about it today, so do check out all of the fantastic blogs that have been published so far. As a final note of thanks, can I thank again, I say thank a third time so you know I'm serious, but thanks so much to Amelda, to Luke, to Damien and to Colin for joining us to discuss uh, this complex but ultimately uh, mutually rewarding uh, relationship between all of the different elements that we've been talking about today. And thank you for listening and for joining us on this UK's Lunch Hour. And hope you all have a lovely day ahead, hopefully with better weather than we are currently experiencing here. So thanks so much and see you again. <laughs>